Like many of us, Scott Gibbs started years ago as a model railroader. He built his first Chemtron C-16 while in high school. Following high school, Scott attended the University of Kansas, earning a degree in mechanical engineering, and then attended the Colorado School of Mines, earning a degree in metallurgy. Scott retired from the Los Alamos National Laboratory as the deputy director after 30 years of service. 20 plus years ago, as a member of the Durango Railroad Historical Society, Scott was instrumental in the decision to not just perform a cosmetic restoration of D and RGW engine 315, but to restore the engine to full service. Today, Scott is president of the Durango Railroad Historical Society, serves as one of Colorado's two commissioners on the board of the Cumberson Toltec Scenic Railroad, and most recently has assumed the role of president of the Cumberson Toltec Scenic Railroad. Scott, the podium is yours. Thanks, Mark, for the introduction. Uh, my two co-authors on this are uh, Tom Artsberger, who is the chief mechanical officer on 315 for Durango Railroad Historical Society, and Max Casillas, who is the project leader uh, for the Cumbries and Toltec, uh, who is leading the work for the railroad on the 1472 service day inspection uh, that CNTS is doing for DRHS. So I think both of them have probably joined us tonight. So let me go back and, and refresh everybody on why do you take these apart every 15 years or 1,472 service days? Um, the federal government got involved many years ago in regulating steam locomotives. Uh, it started with the Boiler Inspection Act in 1911. Uh, what really changed the industry for tourist railroads and operating steam locomotives in this country was the June 16, 1995 Gettysburg boiler, boiler failure and explosion. And that triggered a, a rulemaking process that resulted in 49 CFR Part 230 uh, that describes what you have to do in order to operate a steam locomotive in the United States. And so with that, that new regulation came into effect. Uh, it was a collaboration between industry and um, the regulators and has provided the, the foundation since 2000 for how everybody operates and maintains steam engines. The big difference that occurred uh, with this rule was everybody moved from a time-based you may have heard of flu time um, that allowed locomotives to work so many years before the flus had to be changed uh, to 1,472 service days <clears throat> or 15 years, whichever occurs first. Um, and a service day is a day that the boiler has a fire in it and pressure, it has to have both of those. And so if you hit 15 years or the number of service days, you must disassemble the locomotive and inspect it. Um, so 315 was built in 1895, uh, originally built for the Florence and Cripple Creek. And when the Florence and Cripple Creek had its disastrous flood down Phantom Canyon, uh, it was parked. A few, day, few years later, the Denver and Rio Grande purchased the locomotive and it was originally numbered 425. So many people may have seen it uh, with its movie makeup on running as 425 in the last couple of years. Uh, one of the interesting things about this engine is that it was sort of an experiment. In 1924, the, the Denver Dura Grand replaced the firebox and modified the way the front sheet and the rear sheet were braced. And that allowed the boiler pressure to be raised from 145 PSI to 160. And that left some interesting artifacts that uh, as we've gone through the locomotive right now, you can, you can begin to see, uh, and I'll point those out as we go through this. Um, so the engine was retired 
1949 by the Rio Grande. It served last several years as the uh, Durango switcher. And it sat in the city park in Durango until 2007 when the Durango Railroad Historical Society had spent about eight years uh, initially as a cosmetic restoration and partway through that uh, decided, no, we think we can actually make this thing run again. Um, and so they were successful. It was a mostly volunteer effort guided by a bunch of the uh, staff on the Durango and Silverton Railroad. And one of the key elements of the FRA requirements is you must uh, come up with a new engineering baseline. Uh, and that baseline evaluates the condition of the boiler, looks at the thicknesses of all the parts, uh, recalculates all the stresses throughout the boiler, uh, and then along with an actual physical inspection, uh, you form generate what's called a form four and submit that to the Federal Railroad Administration. Uh, they review it and it, then you're able to uh, legally operate the locomotive. I did the original form four for this locomotive back in about 2005. Uh, I just finished the second version, the update, uh, and submitted it to the FRA as part of the 1472 service day inspection process. Um, it takes quite a few days to go through and recalculate uh, everything on that boiler. So for those of you not familiar with how a fire tube steam locomotive boiler is built, uh, this is actually a cutaway drawing of 315's boiler. Um, and right up here is the throttle and it's connected out here through a, a packing gland. You've got the dry pipe that feeds the steam to the cylinders through here. This bundle is the tube bundle. In 315, there are 152 two-inch tubes. This is the rear flue sheet, and there's a similar flue sheet right here on the front that forms the back end of the smoke box. When we initially talked about the 1472 process, we knew that we had some problems with this rear flue sheet. We'd had a bunch of little cracks between the tubes. So we knew we were gonna go in and replace part of this and basically cut it right here before we get to this curved knuckle and remove this flat section and replace it and then clean up the front and then replace the tubes. Well, as we got into it, uh, we found that uh, the front sheet needed to be up here. This needed to be replaced. And this knuckle actually had some significant corrosion. And we had to come back in here. And there's a riveted joint right there that we had to take out and replace. Um, so our initial planned work went through you have to strip the locomotive. I'll show you a photograph of it stripped down. Uh, we were going to replace that rear flue sheet, replace the knuckle, uh, and then repair the front, update the form four. And then because of we were using grease on the back side of the drivers uh, where they wore against the driver boxes. And what had occurred was the grease was picking up the cinders and one, turning into a wonderful lapping compound. And uh, so our lateral movement of our drivers had, had gotten to the place where we needed to not to uh, correct that. And so uh, then you go through and inspect everything you disassemble. Well, we found a lot of things. So after we went through and disassembled it and started inspecting, uh, we found the, the cab that had been built in about 2005 had several rotted sections and basically the uh, engineer side of the cab had to be rebuilt. The front flue sheet had many holes that were way oversized. And so we elected to, instead of repairing those, come back and replace the front sheet. Uh, we consult, as we consulted with the FRA, they wanted to see us remove the rear flue sheet knuckle and replace it which meant we had to fabricate a new rear sheet, repair the driving boxes, 
Uh, when we took the ash pan out, it had lots of holes. So we built a new ash pan. Here's the engine three days after we started disassembly. Um, it doesn't look like a running steam engine anymore. Um, all of the, what the two guys are doing there, Gene Lincoln and, and Dave, Ta Dave uh, Hibble, they've stripped all the uh, calcium silicate block lagging off the boiler. And that's what this white material is down here. And uh, it took the crew about three days to just strip the locomotive from something that had been running uh, to that. We rolled it into the shop, cleaned it thoroughly, and then we began the process of measuring the thickness of the shell. And what you see here is a 12 by 12 inch grid and ultrasonic measurements are taken at each intersection. And so, for example, right here, you see we've taken four thickness readings on the back head uh, at the intersection of that, that grid line. And then we've taken one out here in the center. And so there were several hundred uh, measurements taken on the barrel, the inside of the firebox, the uh, back head, and the dry pipe. And those all then get factored into how you go about looking at the form four and the calculations of the minimum thicknesses required. The good news is the boiler is in really quite good condition. Most of it is the original 1895 boiler. Um, the, the problem pieces were the rear flue sheet and the front flue sheet. This is a photograph. Uh, Max is in there taking a torch and removing the 152 tubes. And you literally go in and with a gasoline torch, cut the inside of the tube, then with a chisel, break out the, the little stub that's left in the sheet. The tube drops down and there's a master hole that's slightly larger that's down in the bottom and you pull the tube out. So all the tubes were removed. And this is a picture of the the front sheet, the tubes have been removed from it. You'll notice that this little plug right here, that's from when the firebox was changed down in 1924. When the locomotive left Baldwin, it had 154 tubes. Well, the firebox arrangement was very different. And so what the Rio Grande did was they just plugged this tube. There's no place for it on the other end. So they just put a plug in it. Um, you're looking at this from the inside. The tube bundle would be right where we're taking this photograph. These are the braces that hold the, the front sheet in place with the uh, water pressure on this side of the sheet. Let's see. For some reason, here we go. There, uh, these are a couple of the internal photographs. The one on the left, you're looking through the firebox door. And this is not a view that you'd normally get to see because right here in this section would be the, the uh, tube sheet and you'd be looking at a bundle of tubes. Well, that's been removed. And you're looking at the fire, inside of the firebox, looking through the boiler barrel and out the front end and out the front of the smoke box. The other photograph lets you look at how the stay bolts are arranged to hold the crown sheet in place. And this is the region right in here where the knuckle had significant corrosion and the FRA folks came back to us and said, no, we would like you to replace that. So what we did was we cut right through this line of rivets. Max did an amazing job of doing that. And then uh, we're form we have formed a new sheet with that bent to the knuckle. So you can see in the left photograph where we cut through those rivets, you can see the stables down the side of the firebox. Um, and then looking forward from the fire door, this is where the, the lower sheet was cut. And this is the throat sheet on the front side of the boiler. So there's about a three inch gap in here where the water leg would be on the front of the firebox. This has all been fabricated and currently about ready to be reinstalled. 
these three pieces right here are the throat sheet braces that are riveted to the bar boiler barrel. So we then came back and we pulled the number four driver. We're gonna pull all the drivers out, but this shows some of the wear on the driving box. One of the interesting things is you can see right here the Denver and Rio Grande Western uh, imprint in the casting of Babbitt. You can see the wear pattern right around here. And this has all been now machined. And one of the things we've done is we've drilled through here to add an oil feed from the oil cellar up on top. And then this is the, the packing down below for catching oil. And then the, uh, the pad brings the oil up and applies it to the bottom side of the, the driving axle uh, to lubricate the bearing which sits up here on top. So the other half of that thrust face is a bronze liner that sits here on the back of the driver. It's actually held on by, well, it's held on by a couple of, there's six small um, three quarter inch uh, copper rivets that are screwed into the, the face of the driver and then riveted over to hold the, the bronze plate in place. The lower right picture, you can see the, the old worn bronze plate and the, one of the new ones that's being machined to be put in against that, uh, that driver. So here's the, the new flu sheet being fabricated. You can see that you bend that flat steel plate and put that flange on it. The machine we use is that McCabe flanger that's sitting down there in the photograph on the right. That's air operated. It has a large air cylinder at the back of it, uh, which is back over here. And then a clamp cylinder right here. And the plate is clamped into this region. And then there's a set of dies that you use to bend that, that contour around on that steel plate. It's done cold um, and then it's stress relieved. And so these two pieces form that entire rear sheet. We've got 152 holes that so we'll have water jack cut into this plate. Um, the edge of this will be trimmed to match up to the uh, firebox and it'll be welded in. So what do we need to do to finish this? We need to install the front rear sheets, put the tubes in, you roll those tubes into the tube sheet and you bead the ends over so that they have a mechanical uh, lock onto the sheet because you've got the uh, boiler pressure on the inside. And the only thing that holds those sheets in place really are the boiler tubes. Otherwise they'd try and expand and, and go in opposite directions. Then you seal weld the beaded ends to the flue sheets. Uh, we'll test the boiler to 200 PSI, which is part of the CFR regulation. Then we'll put everything back together. Um, we did find that we have to rebuild the Stevenson valve gear link blocks. We had some excessive uh, clearance in them. Um, and we also found a bore problem on the engineer cylinder. So we'll probably have to rebore the, the engineer cylinder as well. The first charter is scheduled for September 24th, and we hope to make that. Um, it's gonna be a, a lot of work between now and then. So if you'd like to help, uh, we'd love to have some assistance. Uh, our initial estimate of doing this uh, was about $70,000 plus about a $30,000 contingency. With all the added scope, we're now looking at probably $135,000 to $150,000 effort to get it back in service. Um, so if you've got any questions, I'll be happy to take those. Jerry, do you want to go ahead and read the uh, chat box, see if there's any questions for Scott there? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, and thanks, Scott. Uh, fascinating look at the parts of a locomotive that most modelers never get to see or even model. <laughs> and uh, very informative. I don't see any questions in the chat box. If anybody has any, uh, put them in right now. Um, the uh, uh, 
DRHS has been very active in uh, restoring not just locomotives, but also a lot of equipment uh, over the past while. Um, I got to see the uh, reefer uh, that they restored some time ago and a uh, fascinating process to see how that was done. Uh, thanks, Scott. Um, I do have two questions have come up in the chat box. Uh, Wayne is asking, will this be run on DNS or Cumbries and Taltech? Um, right now, DRHS has an agreement with Cumbries and Toltec to keep it uh, on the railroad through 2025. Um, one of the issues going back to the DNS is we could run it, DRHS could run it on the DNS during winter uh, or convert the engine to oil burning if we wanted to run it during summer operations. Uh -huh. Uh, we estimate that the conversion to oil would probably be fifty to sixty thousand dollars, and so right now, the the place that we can continue to operate it as a coal burner is uh, on the Cumbries and Toltec. Okay, and the other question from Randy: To your knowledge, has there been any boiler failures in the twenty-seven years since this fourteen seventy-two day process started? Um, had a long conversation with a couple of the FRA inspectors about, about the boilers. Um, there have not been any uh, significant boiler failures. There have been a couple of things where components failed. The most visible one was a UP failure of some flues um, during the event uh, out at the California Railroad Museum uh, quite a few number of years ago. Uh, they had gotten some bad bad tubes and they failed and uh, an awful lot of steam got released through the cab um, but that's the the most significant failure that i think anybody knows about interesting so that seems to be working then yeah the process seems to be working um, and the inspection process uh, is is really quite thorough one of the things that drhs and the cnts did was we invited the the FRA to come in and look at the locomotive after it was stripped. That's not an FRA requirement right now. It will probably get added to the revised part 230 when they roll it out in another year or so. Seems like a practical idea. Yeah, and I, I thought it was the right thing to do. And so we invited our, our inspector to come in and take a look at it. Yeah, good, thanks Scott. Thank you. Scott, again, thank you for your uh, participation tonight and outstanding presentation.